Welcome, friends, to the dream time, where truer things happen than what happened to you or me. I have no words for this story, for dream time stories occur in everywhere. Not in the future, not in the now, not in the past. But here I speak a tongue not native to these stories, and so I cannot express dream time. So when I say a thing happened, just know that it has happened, it is happening, and it will happen. That dream time is parallel to our time and runs through our time. So now we enter the dreaming. There was a drought, one such as the people had never seen. The land was cracked and dry. The rivers were shrunken to tiny streams. And the bark of the people's huts had fallen off and lay rotting on the ground from disuse. For the people, you see, only slept in their huts when the rains came. The young people began to grumble to themselves. The grass had withered to the point where it blew away in the wind, and there were no seeds to grind for food. The kangaroo were dying, and the hunters had to go further and further afield to find game for the hunt. Even the birds, the ducks and the swan, had flown to faraway lands where the rain still came. And the emu, who couldn't fly, even they had run far from this land. We will die, and the tribe will be no more, the young people lamented. And as their laments went from whispers to open talk, people began to speak of Wirinun, the rainmaker. The old folks said he could make the rains come. So why, if he had this power, did he not bring them rain? Word of this reached Wirinun, and he said nothing. But day after day, the young men saw him as they went out to hunt. Each day, he was observed at the shrunken watering hole, placing in it a long stick adorned at the top with brilliant white cockatoo feathers. And next to the stick, he put two great clear stones that he usually secreted about his person. The young men spread the word. Something must be up if Wirinun is taking out his mystic stones in the open like that. Then, on the third day, Wirinun came to the young men and said, Cut enough bark to make a hut for all the people. So the young men went out and cut what bark they could find from the thirsty trees. At last, when they had enough, they returned. And Wirinun said to them to build a mound for the great hut to stand on and gather enough wood for a fire. And so this too, they did. And when they had done so, Wirinun said to all of the tribe, Now, come with me down to the watering hole. And when they got there, he jumped in and waved for them all to join him. So the whole tribe waded into the water and swam and cavorted and played. And while they played, Wirinun snuck up behind each of the young men, leaned over them, and sucked a piece of charcoal out from the back of their heads. What? Each time he did this, he spat it into the water. And just as he had reached the last young man and prepared to get out of the water, he was noticed. And the young man threw him back into the pool. They demanded to know what he was doing. But he said it was all part of the ritual and told the young people it was time to go into the large hut they had built. So the young people all went in, while Wirinun and some of the old folks of the tribe stayed outside. Eventually, the young people had fallen asleep, when suddenly Wirinun burst in, and told them to get all of their things and put them in the great hut, for there was no time to lose. As they went out to collect their possessions, they looked to the sky and saw it dark with great clouds racing through the heavens. They had barely gotten all of their things inside, when a great crack was heard, as if the sky itself was tearing apart. The whole hut shook, and soon the young people cried out in fear. Children started to wail, and dogs began to bark. One of the women shouted, We shall all be killed! But Wirinun turned to them and said fearlessly, I shall go out and stand in the path of the storm. The lightning will come no nearer. And so he left the hut disrobed in the great storm, and started chanting. The rain beat against his body, and the lightning flashed, but the thunder came no nearer to their camp. Soon, the storm began to abate, and for a moment, a slight breeze rustled the air. Then, a total silence fell. For one long breath, all was still. Then, the real rain began. For days, it poured and poured and the old people went out to check on the clouds, while Wirinun went to the watering hole to retrieve his stick and his stones. At last the rain ebbed, and the people emerged from their hut to see a land green and teeming with life. They danced and sang his praise, 
But Wirinun shrugged it off lightly, for he had one last, greater trick. He called upon a fellow rainmaker from a nearby village, and they consulted, heads down, for some time. Then they called both tribes out to the barren plain, where skeletal trees stood solemn in the waste. And together, the rainmakers called a great rain, which extended over the plain, but nowhere else. Soon, the plain had become a lake, and Wirinun turned to the tribe and said, Get your nets and cast them into the water. And so the young men moved off, skeptical that this new lake could have any fish. But they got their nets and cast them anyway, to please the man who had just saved them. And when they hauled in their nets, they found that they were overflowing with aquatic life. And so they celebrated again. The land had been reborn, and so had the tribe. Thanks to Wirinun, the ceremony to turn young boys into men could at last be held, and the next generation could truly begin. <laughs> Oh, I could get used to this dream time. Legendary thanks to patron Kyle Murgatroyd.